Do you remember that? That time when life was nothing but a breeze and happiness was like the wind going against your hair and the sand between your toes. Because with the deep blue green sea and the sun upon your skin, it's almost as if nothing will ever matter. That's what life felt like when we were free. That's what it's like to remember why everyone loves their childhood. Well, at least the ones who can relate to whatever this wave of nostalgia is going to be. Because I'm going to be greater than any- We humans, we're all the same. I don't care. I want it. It doesn't matter. No one piece is free yourself. Ichigo, you are one frightening kid, you know that? You've always thrown everything you could at me. Well, I can take it. And now I can Just give it back. Luck. To have run into me. How about you, Luffy? Is there something you've always wanted to be? It wasn't the watch that was special. It was you. A scattered dream that's like a far-off memory. I want the thrill of victory. Your survival is not enough of a purpose. I want to win this. But the one thing they love more than a hero is to see a hero fail. Die try. Hey, what can I say? I got good taste. <laughs> Growing up in the early 2000s, I was introduced to so many different forms of media that range from everything possibly imaginable. I mean, you had a guy running around in green tights trying to save the same damn princess every game, to these colorful pocket monsters fighting one another and saying their name over and over again, to even a show where imaginary friends are the farthest thing from being just simply imaginable. As a kid, I remember being so indulged into the multifaceted amount of media that was shoved down my throat. And to tell you the truth, I absolutely loved it, but not in that kind of way. You see, this video isn't going to be about why my childhood was the greatest or why your childhood was better than everyone else's, but instead, I want to try to rediscover what that feeling was like when life was almost like a different playing field from what we know today. A time where you would get excited to open that new pack of trading cards or waiting for that midnight release of your favorite new video game, or even what my personal favorite was, staying up late watching those shows I still know and love to this day, on the channel that truly made you feel like some sort of a space cowboy. <laughs> Deck has no pathetic right, cards, Kaiba. <laughs> Although, there are some things we must never forget. Toonami was a network I would never skip a beat on because the amount of joy it brought to me from the shows I knew I was too young to be watching as a kid. But I mean, looking back on it now, I think I was in over my head with that take. But it sure did feel like it back then. You never really knew what was going to come out of these Japanese cartoons, if I'm being honest. And if you don't already know what Toonami is, it's a network to showcase more of the quote-unquote adult-like shows and anime that Cartoon Network deemed to be too much for the younger audience to have on the main network. Even though now, most of the shows that are on Toonami are just the original cartoons that actually premiered on the mainline channel back in the day. Back then and still to this day, we had all the anime classics like Inuyasha, Sailor Moon, Yu Yu Hakusho, Bleach, Zatch Bell, Fooly Cooly, Samurai Champloo, and of course, how could we forget, Cowboy Bebop. Toonami is mainly filled with the mainstream anime series, but they also have the cartoons that we always knew were meant for the Toonami audience. And I think we all know and can agree that from what we remember the most out of the entire network is a franchise that is universally loved by any fan of anime. And that series goes by the name of... Dragon, 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 dragon
My experience with Dragon Ball is nothing out of the ordinary to be real. It was the anime that got me to where I'm at today and without it, this channel would probably never even exist. Because just like myself and a lot of you watching at home, it was the gateway into this outstanding medium we all know and love today. When watching Dragon Ball, specifically Z on Toonami, I'm pretty sure 90% of the time it was just airing the Frieza saga. I feel like I've seen this damn green and blue planet Namek more than I've actually seen the rest of the entire series at this point, but I can still eat good watching the Z fighters getting their asses handed to and Krillin getting blown to pieces over and over again. Just as many times as I can talk about One Piece and pretty much everything I upload. For real though, this saga was something special, and that's not to discredit the rest of the arcs because for a series like Dragon Ball and a network like Toonami, we've all made so many memories from just this show alone. It definitely kept me in a safe space when I knew I couldn't sleep on the weekends because of how much I was wanting to watch the show and on top of the childhood insomnia which didn't really help my case either. However, outside of Dragon Ball and just the entire franchise of Z and GT and just the whole thing as a whole, there was another series that really stood out in some of the most highlighted moments with the network. And that series is none other than my second favorite story of all time and the place where my favorite fictional character resides. If anyone knows me well, they would know that I'm talking about. It was like a nightmare, it's painful for me cause no Attack on Titan, or Shingeki no Kyojin for all y'all who can't unhear anything Japanese out there, is a series that I was first introduced to with the subversion back during the ongoing release in 2013. But this was like my middle school days, and all my friends were only watching stuff in dub. I'm sure some of y'all have friends that are just only dub watchers out there so y'all could relate. So this was like my first on the sideline type of experience with friends for an anime that I knew everything about, but they knew nothing. I felt like light in that one episode of Death Note where he's just about to blow into tears of joy because he knows practically all these characters are, well, about to die. It definitely gave me a different perspective though seeing it from the eye of someone who knows almost everything about this show, at least with the first season alone, so it kind of gave me this feeling I was watching a live action reaction, I guess you could say, to what my friends were about to witness. It's about the same kind of feeling you would get after you just got done watching a really cool scene or an episode from an anime everyone and their moms are talking about and one of your first thoughts are to go straight to YouTube to see what other people think of the peak you just witnessed. That's pretty much the same feeling I'd get every week with a group of friends I'd gather with just to watch that new episode of Attack on Titan on Toonami because obviously season 1 AOT is peak. I gotta give it to you though, if you mess with the dub version of AOT, I can't hate, but if you only watch the dub, guys, we're gonna need to talk. If you didn't grow up watching Toonami though, there's really not much to say to you other than you definitely missed out. It was a network that really brought the light to the night and set the mood for how your weekend was gonna be, especially if you're like me on the edge of your seat for the shows you weren't caught up with, so when that did happen, you'd be so sick not knowing what was gonna happen for another week. So most of the time I would just rush to my computer to see how fast I could catch up to a show because I needed to know what was going to happen next. But hey, if you missed out on Toonami or just were too late for it, I'm sure you definitely started your week right with Yo! How the story goes, we find out by the treasure in the grand line, there's no doubt. The pirate whose eye is on it, he'll sing, I'll be king of the pirates, I'm gonna be king. Outside of watching Toonami, 4Kids was the network dedicated to go for your early morning Saturday cartoons and anime that would play on the CW channel for a 4 hour period before their other programs would run throughout the day. It's one of my most memorable networks, probably even longer than Toonami for me honestly, because it was a channel devoted to giving you a handful of diversity for both boys and girls, but from the most top tier of series that would make a weekly appearance. You had shows like the 2003 Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Sonic X, Kirby Right Back At Ya, Shaman King, and who could forget the 4Kids version of One Piece. 
But what the network had in store for me and caught the attention most out of a young and passionate Augie were the shows that would truly bring out the essence of the heart of the cards. Trading card game shows weren't just shows for my younger self. Rather, these shows would fully encapsulate what it means to be actually immersed into something you really love. I had a bunch of phases that would often switch with each season from the shows that would kind of be in a full of rotation of what I would be submerged into the most. You had me going through my Pokemon, my Yu-Gi-Oh, even chaotic phase for those of you who are cultured out there and know what that is. It was like adopting a new personality. Every time I was tired of the old one, so I kind of was just like, out with the old and in with the new. And as I got older, that also never changed because just within a few years or so later, actually, I, I don't know how long to be exact, but in the near future, I would be adopting a few other personas and would segue from my four kids era and move right into. networks where all these other cartoon and anime would be held, there were a few more out there that showcased a variety of these other trading card game series like shows. Both Cartoon Network and Disney XD were the most notable ones for myself growing up because you had stuff like Bakugan, Beyblade, Dinosaur King, Slug Terra, and a few others that are unforgettable because of just how much of a similar vibe they all gave off. And because of that, for some odd reason, myself and many others really just love this sort of series where a young and ambitious protagonist gets thrown into this world where a trainer, player, or dueler is fighting to become the best in their field. What made everything really special though is that you felt immersed. You felt like you were actually there in their world, getting lost in the dream of whatever you wanted to achieve that fit your goals. And even around the shell of that reality, it was always real with whatever ball, card, or name you'd call out or have in your hand when you stepped into that battle, you would never forget. At the right age of 5 on a special day in 2006, it would be the year that I got my first ever console. It was the Nintendo GameCube and the two games that would staple themselves as the first stamp of approval in my gaming journey was the first ever Animal Crossing and a used copy of one of the greatest games of all time. Super Smash Brothers Melee. Link start. <laughs> is special to me for a few reasons, but I'd argue there's one in particular that in most cases, people would agree upon. We love to get lost in the sauce. Sometimes there isn't really just a way to describe it other than we want to take a break from what's really going on in reality. Growing up, it was easy to load up your GameCube, Wii, PlayStation, Xbox, or if you're a bit older, whatever Unk's first console was, probably an, an NES maybe. But just taking the time to indulge yourself into whatever the world may be and gravitating your rhythm to the story, multiplayer, co-op, characters, fighting mechanics, or whatever the case was, it was a time where you didn't have to worry about what was going on around you because all that mattered were the decisions you made with the controller in your hand and the imagination you carried into how you decided to play a game. It's always interested me just how much of a great period of time it was for gaming with what feels like only something we can look back on now as nostalgia. But just the energy of the early 2000s aesthetic with games like Sonic Adventure 2, Jack and Daxter, The Legend of Zelda Wind Waker, Crash Bandicoot, 
Dude, even Wii Sports Resort had that kind of style traveling into the mid to late 2000s. It's almost hard to even pinpoint an exact theme all these games have in common. I mean, outside of all of them just having the most scenic beach scenery within their games, all these types of games carry a certain vibe that just simply makes you feel good. And I don't know if that's just what nostalgia does to you, but it's a feeling that I never want to fade away from this time period. And to be honest, with how great gaming was back then, that's not to discredit what gaming has brought to us in more recent years. You can probably find a ton of video essays of people complaining about the state of where gaming is headed in our modern era. But I think these days, we're just overcomplicating everything. Gaming isn't dead for a couple reasons, and I'll tell you why. I think it's important to note that gaming isn't dying, but it's the fact that enjoying games like we used to back when we were younger is almost like a completely different ballgame. And sure, you can probably make an argument for a multiplayer deficit in the most recent years, but then again, not that long ago, Fortnite was on top and Among Us was making careers out of people. And now you have people on Marvel Rivals soon to be reigning amongst Overwatch by the end of the year. Although, I think another issue is that people just like to outrightly hate on everything before it even comes out. It almost feels like we can never give anything a chance anymore because of what others around us have to say about a game that they haven't even played yet. And come on, it's not like we haven't been eating good since our younger years. It just so happens now that we got shit to do now. Enjoying things may be just a little bit harder, but it's not because the games have gotten worse or the companies just want to find ways to exploit us for more money. Well, that last part might be true, but genuinely, gaming isn't dead. And it's most certainly not dying. If anything, it makes me more excited to see where it will be within the next coming years. Hell, I mean, catch me playing Black Myth Wukong right after this recording. Just to prove to you that gaming is still with us. And it sure as hell ain't going anywhere anytime soon. Although, to look back, I think another reason why I kind of cherish the younger years of gaming just a little bit more though, is because outside of just any type of console game I was playing as a youngster, it just so happened to be the peak years when I would be getting that head start for what I would consider my own fantasy as the golden age of. PC MMOs. MMOs are without a doubt one of, if not my favorite type of games because of everything that's within the title. At first, who wouldn't love to play something so massively that when you see that player count being so high, it almost feels like it's its own actuality. And the beauty of what captured a lot of these MMOs back then was the aesthetic and creativity these games would bring to their world. You gotta be able to take in everything, and with what most of these games led in our direction, there's not really a better way to put it than it's just simply exciting. However, something that I would see that's kind of frowned upon in more recent years is character creation. Character creation is something I personally love and adore within MMOs because it's where you get to create either one of two things. Trust me, there's no in between. For one, either you create the character that's nothing like you, you know, the character that you always imagine you being yourself as, or maybe the most random colorful character that surely doesn't belong in this world, but because you made them, they kind of found a special place to fit just right in. Or What's the most common? Going down the gender fluid route and making the girl boss you know you really are. But secondly, if you're anything like me, you try your best to create yourself in the game to what's most accurately possible from the given option you use to create your character. Obviously, there's going to be a little bit more of a cool factor involved when trying to make that character, but ain't nobody got to know that. Outside of your OC though, MMOs range in almost every type of genre. Some of my favorites though definitely all give off a different vibe. Club Penguin, Free Realms, Wizard 101, Lego Universe, Monkey Quest, hell, even Moshi Monsters hit for a period of time. But most importantly, the game that would change my life, quite literally, as I know it. Fusion Fall. Fall is an MMO that I feel the need to really jump back in time to talk about because of just how much of a generational game this was back when I was a kid. It had everything I ever wanted from a game including a solid and drippy character creation, world building, an interesting and cohesive plot, and most importantly, 
the iconic and recognizable characters to play alongside with. I think what really establishes this game to be so good was just how well they threw all these Cartoon Network classics together and made it seem like they were really all from the same world. Having to choose between either Ben 10, Dexter, Mojo Jojo, even Double D from Ed, Ed and Eddie as a mentor figure throughout your journey felt like you were a part of some sort of Avengers lineup with all your favorite characters you grew up with. This game made it so even the heroes and villains from their universes would have to join forces, because in order to defeat the big bad known as Fuse, they would all seemingly have to come together and figure out what's going to be the plan of action to save the world. But that's where you come in. And saving the world seems to be a lot easier with your little mini cartoon favorites by your side known as Nanos. And who can forget, whatever wacky or cool cosmetic you could equip to make those missions feel just a bit more real. This game, to be real with you, had it all. Even the art direction for some of these characters and redesigns truly made everything really come together. And that's why it's so cherishable to me, because not only are you trying to save these characters that have all brought you joy as a kid, but you're doing it with the other people playing with you that makes these games all the more better. MMOs are a place to delve into another world outside of your own to create, build, cook, fish, explore, and dress to impress the others out there trying to make their day just a little bit more imaginative. You see, it's not always about grinding the game for these rare items and exclusives that are only there to get you in. But it's about the time you really cherish while playing these games, especially from the era that reminds us why we love to look back on on that time when things were different. And games like these weren't just a memory, but a saved place to come back to whenever you were ready. But look around you now, it's 2024 and honestly, I think after everything, it's important to note that while the times we look back on during our childhood are over, that flame we once had ignited within doesn't always have to be closed off forever. It's about how you take that energy from when we were young and push it into what we can experience today. We can always look back and appreciate the times that made us who we are now, but I think it would be unfair to ourselves to not be able to take the kid who made you who you are today and let them roam free. Let the you out who enjoyed all these games, cartoons, anime, movies, whatever, and really just try and enjoy the media of today. Put yourself on the path to what's being brought to the world right now, because if you can do that, I can promise you this, that feeling you once had as a kid will come back and it will never fade away.